What's up, sports fans? It's time for Let Me Speak. I'm Joe Braverman, and on this show, we discuss the big news in the world of sports as heard from me, myself, and I. Here's what we'll be talking about this week. With nearly 24 hours before the trade deadline, breaking down the moves made in the MLB so far. Plus, the headlines after one week of NFL training camps, including significant injuries. And picking a side between Jonathan Taylor and Jim Irsay. You're listening to episode 84 of Let Me Speak. Let's get things started. Cue the intro. Let me speak. Back in the saddle and ready to roll. You are listening to episode 84 of Let Me Speak. We are recording here on Monday, July 31st, 2023 here from Swamp Scott, Massachusetts. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in wherever you are getting this podcast. If you're listening to us on any streaming platform, thank you for listening. Or if you're watching us on YouTube, thank you for watching. In the past week or so, it has been... Kind of crazy if you ask me. I mean, Massachusetts has been hit with some tornadoes and some pretty crazy storms, but it is gorgeous outside. I'm looking right outside the window, and I see nothing but sunshine and blue sky, and hopefully those temps stay right where they are because this is absolutely peaceful. Now, allergies, on the other hand, could be a little bit better, Um, (laughs) but we are are persevering. We're pushing through, and uh, just like we are pushing through, So is the MLB season, and of course, the trade deadline is all the talk of the town right now in the MLB. We're sitting here at about 5 o'clock, so it's almost 24 hours before the deadline closes, and there could be some more landmark moves to be made before we are uh, done recording this. So if there are any breaking news that come around, we're definitely going to let you know. Let's talk about some of the moves that have been made so far, and honestly, there's one team that's been absolutely huge in the trade market right now, and that's the Texas Rangers. I mean, the moves that they've made so far show that they are clearly going for it. They're going for the playoffs, the division, the World Series, everything. And honestly, when you think about it, it makes sense as to why the Rangers would want to go for it this year. Because really, at least in my eyes, the American League has never been so wide open. I mean, when the season first started and Tampa got off to that hot start, you would think Tampa is the team to watch for. They look like the runaway favorites to come out of the American League. But sure enough, they come in with a collapse. The Orioles overtake them. You got a bunch of shuffling going on in the Central Division. And then, of course, the Rangers with their good start over the Houston Astros. They still leave the Astros. Um, But it does make sense for how deep the American League is and that there's no clear-cut favorite between anyone in the American League, even going to the wild card. I mean, we're about though that's about six or seven teams deep that could make a run. Um, so I can see why Texas is going all in and wanting to go for it in this year. So so far, let's look at the three big names that they've gotten. Max Scherzer, the big one. Jordan Montgomery and Chris Stratton. Now, I think the the Mets philosophy is that what Steve Cohen was thinking when he made all these moves, he gave the big contract to Scherzer, gave the big contract to Justin Verlander, who might be another name out there. He kind of saw this as a new modern, you know, the way that George Steinbrenner and the Yankees would run things is putting all their money into the best players. But they forgot to understand that Max Scherzer is 39 years old and that Justin Verlander is nearly 40 years old. So if you're divesting that money, I mean, not everyone is Tom Brady and is going to play until 50 or 60. Um, So that's, I think, the decision with Cohen. And obviously he regrets it. Otherwise, he wouldn't be selling off all these pieces. And I think Scherzer is a great fit for Texas because that rotation in that starting five just gets so much better. I mean, 
for a healthy team because we just saw that Nathan Evaldi hit the 15-day IL. But your starting five for Texas is Scherzer, Nate Evaldi, Jordan Montgomery, John Gray, and Dane Dunning. I mean, that is an insane starting five. And you've got Martin Perez and Andrew Heaney in the bullpen. I mean, come on. What better rotation is there than that? Now, Chris Stratton, on the other hand, the big thing with Texas, because they have a great lineup. I mean, they had five all-star starters, I believe, uh, in this year's all-star game. So the lineup is no, there's no problem with that. But it was the pitching that I think they really needed to focus on. They've got the fourth worst bullpen ERA with a 4.83. You know who's ahead of them in those standings? The A's, the Nats, and the Royals. And they all stink. They're in the cellar. So if you're telling me that the Texas starting bullpen is in that category with them, you know, just like every championship contender does, they have to sure up that bullpen. And Chris Stratton could be a guy to do it. They already grabbed a Roldis Chapman uh, way before the deadline. So they have a setup man slash a closer. So bullpen, bullpen, bullpen. That's going to be absolutely huge. Uh, if the offense doesn't give them a big enough lead, because let's face it, the lineups, every lineup, is going to have a stretch where they struggle, where they're not going to get uh, five or six runs or they're not going to get seven or eight, something like that. So the bullpen's got to hold it down. And Texas needs to sure that up if they want to have a chance. Um, after these moves, I would say that this is a team that would be put as the AL favorites. Because, I mean, even if they had to go to the wild card route, you've got Max Scherzer, who knows how to do it in the bullpen, and is maybe the most decorated starter in the majors right now. You've also got Nathan Evaldi in that second game, who, when healthy, has been one of the most dominant pitchers, and in my mind, should have been the starter in the All-Star game, um, and should be the front runner for the AL Cy Young, if it's not going to Shohei Otani. Uh, so that two out of three, you got those two guys there. Um, you And then you look at all the other opponents that you have when you get to the ALDS and the ALCS. I mean, out of all the possible postseason teams, I would put them ahead of everybody uh, just because of the talent that they have. You know, honestly, I can't trust Tampa. I can't trust Baltimore because they're too young. Can't trust anyone in the Central. Um, if they can get over the Houston Astros, then I say, Sure, absolutely. And Houston has been struggling, okay? Keep that in mind. Houston is a struggling team. So if you're asking me, I think Texas is the favorites to come out of the American League. Now, can I put them as I will put my money on them to win the World Series? No, I'm not going to go to DraftKings or to FanDuel and put any money down on Texas because let's face it, this was a team that had been averaging 50 and 60 wins for about four years or so. And all of a sudden, they turn things around. Um, aside from, you know, the, that starting rotation and um, in their lineup, maybe Marcus Simeon and Corey Seager. Other than that, no one has any postseason uh, experience. Now, their manager has a ton of experience and is on his way to the Hall of Fame and Bruce Bochy. So he knows how to do it. So if the lineup can stay, can, can stay consistent and play the way they're playing, then I would say yes put them as the World Series favorites, but right now I can't. I can put them as the league favorites, but not the World Series favorites. So I think Texas so far has been the big winner so far uh, at tra uh, for trade season in the MLB. The team in their division, though, that's also been making noise is the Angels. And even if they are not a winner or a loser in this, they are literally doing everything they can to please Shohei Otani by making the playoffs. And I've said this for multiple weeks now, is that... The Angels really have no choice but to do everything they can. I mean, look at the prospects that they uh, had had uh, put in there. Um, they basically given Chicago their entire farm system. That's really all they've done just to please Shohei. And it might not work. It might not work to see because uh, Sho Shohei Otani might leave. He might leave um, regardless of the decision. Um, which, which, by the way, just a quick side note, the doubleheader last week from Shohei, just there's there are some things that I think he has already done, but then he just does more. You know, game one, he does a one-hit complete game shutout. Game two, he puts in two homers. I mean, come on. 
This guy should be a unanimous MVP uh, in the American League. I can't say Cy Young, but just the fact that he's doing both has been absolutely unreal. But looking at the the moves that the Angels have made so far, they grabbed Lucas Giolito and Ronaldo Lopez from the White Sox. And I said this last week, and I've said it uh, for a long time now, is that the Angels have always had a problem with pitching. Even the big guys that they get in the free agent market, it still hasn't worked. And really, Otani is like the only pitcher that they've gotten who have worked. They've got a starter's ERA of 450 and a bullpen ERA of 417. So, I mean, once you get Giolito from Chicago, he's already the second best starter. He's gone six and six, 379 ERA with the White Sox. You already put him in there and you've got your top two. So, if they can make the playoffs um, with that pitching, those are your two guys that are going to start Shohei and Giolito. But then over the weekend yesterday, from Colorado, they grabbed Randall Gritchick and C.J. Crone from the Rockies. Now, the the big thing that the Angels have relied on has been their lineup. I mean, they've their top ten in average on base percentage, slugging, and OPS. And the problem that they're dealing now is that they've got a ton of injuries. I mean, you had the ugly scene with Taylor Ward uh, getting hit in the face by Alec Manoa. Uh, he's got a facial fracture, but then everyone else in the lineup, Mike Trout, Max Stassi, Brandon Drury, Gio Urshila. I mean, this is a lineup that is the epitome of home runs or strikeouts. So really they're banking on their power hitting because they are third in the league in home runs, but they've struck out the fifth most times. So you bring in a guy like CJ Crone, who's got some good home run numbers, 11 homers, 32 RBIs, You've also got Randall Gritchuk, who gives you some depth in that lineup uh, with his 308 average. He can get himself on base, uh, which can set up guys like Otani and Trout uh, and Rendon when he's healthy. So if you're asking me, I don't know if the Angels have done a lot because, I mean, let's face it, just looking at the standings right now, they've been on a, a really good streak. They're 7-3 and three in their last 10. Uh, they sit four games behind the Astros uh, for that third wild card spot. and the team they have to get to to get one spot above. Because right now, they're a half game behind the Yankees and then a game game and a half behind the Red Sox. Those are the two teams that are in front of them. And can they keep this pace up? I don't know. I'm just, I'm pulling up their schedule real quick just to see who else they've gotten. Because they did have a really good series. They took, they did lose two out of three, but they did gain some stuff uh, with the Blue Jays. But, just looking at the schedule, now they've got three against Atlanta. That's not going to be pretty. Four at home versus Seattle. Three at home, San Francisco. You've got Houston, Texas, Tampa, Cincy, uh, Philly, Baltimore again. Um, so this it's a very daunting schedule. Um, but in terms of did they give themselves a chance? I hate to say it, but I don't. I still would not put them in the playoff conversation, just because, you know, this has been a good stretch, um, but they can't rely on Shohei Otani. And I know Mike Trout will eventually come back, but can you really bank on that? I- I'm not 100% sure because the Angels are just a franchise known for choking. They're just known for choking things away. So that's why I can't, you know, like I say, go go to the uh, go to FanDuel and put money on the Angels to make the playoffs. Did they get better? Yes, but I don't think they've gotten significantly better where they can make the postseason. Now, I only say I could see them getting one spot out of it because I don't see uh, I don't see Tampa collapsing out of a postseason spot. I don't see Houston or Texas, for that matter, collapsing out of a playoff spot. The Blue Jays, maybe. But I mean, the, the Red Sox and the Yankees are going to be right there if they do slide out. So. I can't I can't see the Angels unfortunately making the postseason. Even though they've got a bunch of great moves, they've just got a really tough schedule ahead of them and honestly, I don't know if they can do it. I think they maybe have fallen behind too much and plus with the franchise history, I think they needed a little bit more depth uh at least in the starting rotation. Maybe they get another one, but as of right now, I still think with the moves they made, they're going to miss out on the postseason, which will be tough cuz I think you know, ask any 
standard MLB fan, they would love to see Otani and Trout do some stuff in the postseason. I think I don't even think Mike Trout has a hit in the postseason. And the last time he made it was a decade ago. Uh, I think it was 2014 was the last time. And we have yet to see Otani in the postseason, which it, it stinks. That's the only reason I'd root for the Angels. But realistically, I can't see them making any kind of run uh, to get into the postseason. But speaking of a team in L.A., how about the other team, the Dodgers? That's the last team I wanted to talk about here. I mean, let's face it. They're always active, involved. Went in regards to buying at the deadline. I mean, they've already gotten a starter in Lance Lynn. They got a reliever in Joe Kelly. They got a utility man in the in an old face, Kike Hernandez. Because really, what's the problem with the Dodgers is has been their bullpen. I mean, I've never seen pitching for LA as bad as it is. These are the numbers right now. Among their starters, they're sixth worst in ERA at 476. In the bullpen, they're 22nd with a 4.16 ERA. I mean, this used to be a team that had tremendous pitching depth, but now outside of Clayton Kershaw, and even he's an asterisk, everyone stinks or is either hurt. Because this ro- this rotation would be so much better if they had Dustin May or Walker Bueller, just to name a few guys. But Bueller had the Tommy John. Dustin May is now out for the year. And then you're relying on guys who had good years but just can't back it up, like Urias and uh, Tony Gonsolin. And they're not as good as they were a year ago. So really the rotation is where I'm looking at because their lineup is totally fine. You got Betts, Martinez, um, uh, Muncy, you know, just just to name a few, Smith. They they just have an array of talent. Uh, surrounding them. So, uh, I, Freddie Freeman, of course, at first base. Um, so if you're asking me, I think the Dodgers lineup is fine, but starter is where they're going. And we've heard reports that they're thinking about Justin Verlander. I mean, if Justin Verlander lands on the Dodgers, I mean, look out. I mean, it, it wouldn't surprise me if the Dodgers, you know, are able to require Justin Verlander. Um, but Considering where the Dodgers are at right now, that's really the only area they have to focus on. And really, if you're asking me, it's just that's just what the Dodgers do. We know they'll get into the postseason, but it's about making a World Series run because they are leading the division right now. Just uh, pulling up the standings really quickly. They are two games ahead of the Giants. You know, the Diamondbacks have come back to earth. The Padres still haven't done anything. And the Giants are still, you know, kind of iffy, you know. So this hasn't been a great regular season, but the fact that they're still winning the division with the starting pitching that they have, you know, you just sure that up and you can compete. Now, do I still think they're not as good as the Braves? No. But do I expect a Braves-Dodgers uh, were possible National League Championship Series? Yes, I do. And the Dodgers are realistically looking at that. They're they're looking ahead to the DS because really Cincy and Milwaukee, they're not really competitors right now. The Giants, you know, they've beaten them in the past. The Marlins, the Phillies, I still think they're better than them. Um, so that's what I'm looking at with the Dodgers and really for all the MLB. Everyone's gonna sure up their pitching. Uh, but there's no doubt about it that the Dodgers are the team to really watch out for when it comes to starting pitching and possibly Justin Verlander. So Again, almost 24 hours away, so this could be all minute by the time tomorrow rolls around. By Tuesday at 6 o'clock when the deadline closes and we see who made the moves and who didn't make the moves. Um, So that's what's going on in baseball, but up next we talk about football. Football is back via training camps, and we'll look at the teams who are making the most headlines through the first week of training camp season. All right, football fans, you know that time of year. Training camps get underway, which only means the game action is just that much closer. I mean, preseason will start in the middle of August. From here, it's about two weeks or so, I want to guess, maybe like a week and a half. But game action is so close. In fact, 
the Hall of Fame game uh, is going to take place this Thursday between the Jets and the Browns. And honestly, for me, you know, I'm not I'm not going to pay attention, obviously. You know, I'm not going to invest into it uh, because I would love I would love to see the Jets starters. But honestly, that's probably not going to happen with a preseason game. Plus, you've got so many big stars uh, on the Jets team, so it's probably not going to happen. But it's just going to be some nice background noise to have on. And really, the Jets are the first team that uh, I've really been paying close attention to because I said last week that from uh, practice videos is that uh, everyone looks in sync. Everyone looks smooth. Um, we're seeing Aaron Rodgers and Garrett Wilson have a really good connection. Um, so... I mean, that's one thing. The other thing you got to also mention is Dalvin Cook is close to signing with New York. I mean, he was hanging around the practice yesterday. Um, and it, in my opinion, I think if they do sign Dalvin Cook, I mean, you've got a good uh, backup, really, because that's really what I'm looking at, is that Dalvin Cook would balance out Brees Hall. Because we know Brees Hall is coming off a major, major injury. So if you give Brees Hall, maybe not an entire workload, but you've got a guy talented enough like Dalvin Cook who can take over the lead uh, the lead role in the backfield while Brees Hall is sort of managing that injury back and just trying to get his football feet back under him, that would be an insane improvement by the Jets. And I already told you that position-wise, you know, they looked locked at almost everywhere. O-line, corner, uh, you know, Sauce Gardner and Garrett Wilson are going back and forth with each other. I mean, I, I think if you have to ask me, if if Cook does sign, it would be the most talented roster in the NFL. Now, that doesn't mean we're picking them to win the Super Bowl. Of course not. Of course not. But on the 53-man roster, everyone they have lined up on projected starters, if 90% of them are fairly good talent, everyone is talking them up, then I would say that's a very talented team. So, I mean, we and we've seen talented teams or who have the most talent, superstar players, etc. They haven't won the big one. But I think I'm not I'm not putting the Jets in the Super Bowl, but if they do sign Dalvin Cook, it would be the most talented team in the NFL. That doesn't mean I'm projecting them for 11 or 12 wins. I'm just saying they have talent. They have the most talent. Can they put it together? Can Robert Sala uh, get a good game plan on the offense and the defensive side of the ball? I don't know. But Dalvin Cook in that backfield with Aaron Rodgers, with all of the receivers that they have and the strong offensive line slash defense, it's the most talented team in football. So that's the first team I'm watching for because they have so many new pieces and it's almost kind of like a new culture kind of thing for the Jets. But staying in the division, I'm also looking at the Dolphins because the big injury has been Jalen Ramsey. Um, maybe the best cornerback tandem with him and Xavier Howard uh, on each side, of the, each side of the field. And now Ramsey is out indefinitely with a knee injury. They're talking uh, with this meniscus tear six to eight weeks. Ramsey says he's going to try and get ahead of his timetable, possibly in November rather than December. We don't know. I still think it's a fairly good defense with Miami, but I just, that's that's a bad injury to have. I mean, we know injuries are going to happen. I mean, today we saw Tim Patrick in Denver, uh, the fear of a possible torn Achilles for Denver. So that uh, sucks for them. But on Miami side of things, I'm really looking at 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 Tua because, like like I said, is that Tua is the only thing getting in the way of the Dolphins having success because we know we saw what they did last year with a healthy Tua Tagovailoa. And the fact is, if he stays upright, he can be a very good quarterback and lead this team to the postseason. Interesting, this past Sunday, uh, when I was producing Travis Thomas on WEI, he predicted them to win the division. I mean, that sounds kind of crazy for them to win the division because I still think the Bills... Uh, like I said last week, I think the Bills are still the favorites and will win that division. You know, Stephon Diggs, even though he's been upset um, and uh, stuff like that, uh, for, he's still upset with what happened in January against Cincinnati. I still think they find a way to piece it together and win that division. But 
for the Dol- the Dolphins can be a good team. I mean, like I said, the AFC East is probably going to be the most competitive division in the NFL. You might have the Patriots, who I possibly predict to finish in last place with a, a plus 500 record. Um, and and all four teams have the ability to make the playoffs. Um, so I think this could be a slip up that doesn't look significant at the time, but when it comes around, you might realize, ooh, Jalen Ramsey might be a little more important than we think. Because let's face it, uh, the uh, you got Aaron Rodgers and the Jets, you got Josh Allen and the Bills. Um, put aside, put on all the other offenses that the Jets have to face or uh, the Dolphins have to face. Um, and it's a daunting task. And if they had those two cornerbacks, I would have said, yes, they can contend for the division maybe until the last week or two of the season. But looking, you know, just think about the offenses they'll have to take on uh, at least until December. I mean, you've got Herbert and the Chargers, uh, Russ Wilson. I talked about uh, the Bills and the Jets, the Eagles, uh, the Chiefs, uh, the just to name a few. I mean. I really do think that it's going to, it's a big injury. You know, I know cornerbacks, you know, there's no such thing as a shutdown corner anymore, but Jalen Ramsey has been pretty close to it. And the fact that him and Xavier and Howard were on both sides of the field, um, I think that uh, made that defense maybe the best in football. But now if they don't have one of the two, I don't know. I feel like that passing defense is going to struggle a little bit. You know, I know they've got good linebackers and Christian Wilkins anchoring the defensive line, but I don't know. No Jalen Ramsey, a guy who's got the experience for a, a relatively young team. I mean, I know they might made the postseason, but I, I think this is going to come back and hurt the Dolphins more than people think. You know, like I said, it relies on Tua, but I still believe this injury is going to be a significant one. But one other injury that I'm looking at is obviously with the Bengals, and that's with Joe Burrow. I mean, we saw we saw the video of him, uh, non-contact injury. He was limping. He had to get carted off. Uh, luckily, it was only a calf injury, and he's only going to be out a few weeks. Could have been a lot worse because, I mean, let's face it. If you have Joe Burrow, a four-year quarterback, or going into his fourth year, and he misses action with a torn ACL and a severe Achilles injury, that's not a promising sign for the future, at least for Joe Burrow. But the fact that it's a calf injury, uh, that's a big sigh of relief for everyone in Cincinnati. Because let's face it, Joe Burrow is, many are saying, the predecessor to Patrick Mahomes and to Josh Allen in the AFC and that the Bengals uh, are on their way back to the Super Bowl, possibly. And really, Joe Burrow, if he's not in that lineup, if he's not out there on game day, Well, guess what? Cincinnati screwed because not only in the division do you have the Bengals, uh, the uh, Ravens beefing up, and you still have the Browns and Steelers who can be pests in the AFC North. The Bengals are in no way going to match Kansas City or Buffalo or any of these other Super Bowl contending teams in the AFC because Joe Burrow has been one of the few guys that's been able to go back and forth, tick for tack, with Patrick Mahomes and that Chiefs team. And if he's not out there and the backup Trevor Simeon is getting snaps in a big uh, postseason game or anything like that, oh boy, that is going to be a route unlike no other. Joe Burrow makes the Bengals go, and without him, they would be screwed. So I am monitoring, monitoring Joe Burrow. If he's the Bengals, if I'm Zach Taylor, I am waiting until so Burrow is 100% to get him back out on the field and to get him back out in practice. Because let's face it, that guy is the franchise. He is the Cincinnati Bengals right now. And if you have Simeon throwing to Jamar Chase and to T. Higgins, and he's uh, dumping it off to Joe Mixon, that's not a recipe for success. That's a recipe for a first-round exit, if you're asking me, if they even get that far so keep eyes out for joe burrow because no questions there's no questions asked that he knows what he's doing and the offensive uh the the schematic on offense is staying the same okay they barely made any additions at all to that offense so that offense stays the same the game plan is the same burrow knows what he's doing it's just getting his legs under him so i am watching 
for that cap on Joe Burrow. If it's not 100%, he should not be taking the field. And luckily, there are probably going to be much more headlines once we get deeper and deeper into camp. The preseason gets underway. Um, so there's going to be a lot to look forward to in the NFL. And coming up next, there's a lot more topics that we have to discuss, including the newest tale in running back drama in the NFL. You're not going to believe who's requesting a trade now. We move on now to quick hits, which is basically a summary of all the headlines that couldn't make it in their own segment. And there are five headlines I want to talk about and that are the talk of the sports world. And we're staying in football for the first couple. I mean, we talked last week about the running back drama. Luckily, Saquon Barkley got his situation figured out. He's going to be making more than the franchise tag um, that he signed. We're still waiting about Josh Jacobs, anything like that. But another star running back has gotten into his own situation, and that is Jonathan Taylor, the former leading rusher back in 2021 for the Colts. The drama continues as he formally requested a trade after a meeting that took place apparently for an hour with Jim Ursay. And speaking of Jim Ursay, he has decided to dig into his heels and say that he is not going to trade Jonathan Taylor, regardless of any kind of his request. Now, let's just put it like this. Jim Irsay, at least to the standard football fan, is one of the most unlikable people around football and in the NFL. Because this is a guy who continues to toot his own horn. You want to know how bad it, you want to know what it's like, just look up at the Indianapolis Stadium and see AFC runner-up back from 2015. They put that banner up. That's what Jim Irsay is. For a legendary franchise that has had Peyton Manning and Andrew Luck, this is a guy that um, decides to literally jump on whatever kind of success he has and just makes headline after headline. Now, the drama with this is what we heard on Sunday night, which was that there's apparently a pre-existing uh, injury that Taylor had before getting to camp. And that was a back injury. And Ursay said they might put him on the NFI list. And that would withhold the salary uh, that Taylor is supposed to be uh, paid. And we already saw on, on Twitter or X, I guess now, I'm not going to get used to that. It's still going to be Twitter to me, is that Taylor refuted uh, that he had back pain or reported back pain. And honestly, if you ask me, Jim Ursay would be a great politician because he will say and do anything to get his way. He wants to be, he, he's literally stuck on his morals and all his decisions. I mean, let, let's just put it like this. If I'm picking a side, I'm going with Jonathan Taylor because if I'm a guy like Taylor and I don't see a winning season in relative distance, because I mean, let's face it, if you're going to start Anthony Richardson, um, you're not going to be contenders for the postseason, even with as bad as the division that they're in is. Um, if I'm Jonathan Taylor and I don't know what direction I'm going in and Jim Ursay is just playing a bunch, uh, putting some words in a salad and mumbling them up together. And I have no idea what's going on. That's what I would do. That's what I would say for Jonathan Taylor is I want out of here. But Jim Ursay, again, stuck in his own ways, stuck in his own morals and beliefs and anything like that is that he wants to keep them. And honestly, I'm not a big fan of that. I would want to see Taylor on a different team. That's how I would see it. Um, but if you're you're really if you're thinking about it, at least in in my eyes, is that Jim Ursay continues to just, as I say, stuck in his own ways, and he just continues to be. Remember, he was the guy that teased the owners um, voting out uh, Dan Snyder at the time before he sold the team, and. On it, honestly, like the owners were just like, shush, 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 don't say that. But Jim Ursay literally outs himself with every single passing headline or whatever. Um, so really, 
I think if I was, again, picking a side, I would go with Taylor because you can't trust Jim Ursay as far as you can throw him. That's if you ask me. Um, but staying in football and staying in drama, we have some new drama with some some star future Hall of Famers and what I would call some uh, well-respected personalities in the NFL, and it re- involves Aaron Rodgers and Sean Payton. Now, so um, the story, how this starts, is Sean Payton, the new head coach of the Denver Broncos, goes on and criticizes the former head coach of the Broncos in Nathaniel Hackett, who happens to be one of Aaron Rodgers' favorite coaches. He was an OC for the Packers. Now he's the OC for the Jets. But the way Peyton said it was that, quote, Nathaniel Hackett with the Broncos did one of the worst coaching jobs in NFL history. Now, number one, duh. I mean, who honestly thought that what Nathaniel Hackett did in Denver was good and was actually successful? The dude didn't make it through his first full season, okay? It's him and Urban Meyer in that distinct category, basically the hall of shame in terms of coaching performances. That's what I would say. So Peyton is just saying nothing but the truth, okay? He's saying what everyone else is thinking, okay? You know, maybe as time goes on, we realize, oh, it was Russell Wilson more than Nathaniel Hackett. But at the moment, Hackett is the one who is getting blamed for this. And he did later apologize saying, oh, I had my Fox hat on because he spent time with Fox from his time in between New Orleans and Denver. But then Rodgers yesterday comes out and literally drops a bomb on the situation and says, I think it was way out of line, inappropriate, and I think he needs to keep my coach's name out of his mouth. Oh, boy, Aaron Rodgers just went Will Smith on Sean Payton. I mean, that is the 2023 football season, just like the 2022 Oscars. I mean, if I had like a rap horn of like a burn, you know, burn, 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 total burn, that's how I would be doing it with Aaron Rodgers because, oh my goodness, what a quote that he decided. And I thought these guys were good. I thought, you know, I've seen Sean Payton and Aaron Rodgers get along very well. But the fact that Rodgers is saying this about Payton, that just makes me so eager for 425 on week five of the NFL season in Denver when Rodgers and Hackett take on Peyton and Wilson. That's going to be so, so exciting to watch because the drama is going to boil over. It might not be in the game, but when it comes to the handshakes, you best believe that Aaron Rodgers, because he is the drama, ego, spotlight, everything like that, he's going to find a way, whether it's intentional or not, that he's going to, he's going to find a way to put fuel and put gasoline on this fire to make it bigger than it already is so boy Aaron Rodgers just made something out of nothing Uh, but staying in football we go to the college game and we talk about another conference realignment and that is with Colorado Colorado in 2024 is heading to the big 12 Uh, they are leaving the Pac-12 and going back to their old conference and honestly you ask me I think it's good for the Big 12 because they need eyes. They need eyes on their conference because, let's face it, every conference right now is getting blasted by the SEC in literally every way. Money, TV rights, social media, all that kind of stuff. They are getting blown out by the SEC. So the Big 12, because they won't have Texas and they won't have Oklahoma, they're jumping to the bigger conference. They need something that will gravitate the headlines. And I think... There's no bigger name in college football right now than Deion Sanders. Everyone is talking about his jump to Colorado. What is he going to do with the program? All the turnaround that he said. Only like, I think, five of the original teams on last year's Colorado team is still out there. Deion overhauling everything. So really, that's what's going to be appealing is getting Deion Sanders in the Big 12 because it keeps the Big 12 relevant. I mean, really, honestly, how many people knew of the Big 12 and followed all the uh, championship. I know TCU, they won the conference or whatever, and they got into the playoffs. But honestly, like ask any fair weather college football fan outside of Texas and Oklahoma, what other teams do you think people actually care about? Because it's not Oklahoma State. It's not Baylor. It's not TCU, no matter how good they've done. It's Texas and Oklahoma. 
And if you lose those two big names, you need to replace it with another big name. And primetime Sanders is the guy to do that. And unfortunately, we won't be able to see it until next year. But again, more conference realignment, and it just puts more, it's just more jumbling in the college football system, where eventually, what I think, they're going to do away with the conferences. It's going to be one big mega conference where the Power Five come together and they figure out something like that. So that's what I see with Colorado heading to the Big 12 next year. Moving on, though, we get into some basketball. And we talk about the NBA here because NBA teams just got a memo uh, from the league about Damian Lillard. Yes, the situation that still has not resolved itself. Um, of course, the reports came out that Dame Lillard would only play for the Miami Heat and that he's not going to invest anything if he gets traded to anywhere else. And that led the team, uh, the league, at least to sit down with Dame and his agent. They talked about it. And now the NBA has just sent a memo saying, you know, disregard it. Basically, disregard that statement. Damian Lillard will play for your team if he does get traded. Don't shy away from it. But basically... All it is is that Dame and his agent got caught with their hand in the cookie jar. That's all it is, and they're just trying to make up for it. They're saying, oh, absolutely, I, I don't think this at all. Of course I'm going to put in 100%. Absolutely. But let's be honest. We know where this ends. Like I, I've said this for weeks now. The situation with Damian Lillard ends with him in a Miami Heat jersey. That's how this ends. So they can send out this memo all they want. They can tell the teams, oh, we talked with him, and he's going to play for whatever team he possibly gets traded for. But let's be honest. He's only going to play for the Miami Heat. I don't think teams look at that, look at the memo, and say, huh, he must be right. Maybe he will play for us. Let's give him a trade. No, they believe that Damian Lillard will only focus on the Miami Heat. So honestly, if you ask me, it's much to do about nothing. The memo means nothing. Damian Lillard. Lillard is only going to play for the Miami Heat. Um, and then this last story is a, is a little bit sad, sticking with basketball, and it has to do with Bronny James. I just wanted to mention it real quick. He suffered cardiac arrest uh, practicing for USC. This was on Tuesday, and I believe he got released from the hospital on Friday, and he's just resting at home. And you know, I, I won't talk too much about like the basketball side of it. What does it mean for USA and stuff like that? Um, but I'm just I'm wishing nothing but the best for Bronny. I mean, the kid is 18. He's 18 years old and he suffers this event. That's just it's absolutely sad what what happened to him while he was practicing for the Trojans. And of course, to LeBron James and his family, of course, no no father should have to go through anything like this. And I I really hope that Bronny is going to be okay. He's going to get healthy. And I do want to see him on the basketball court. I, I really, I really do because I, I not, not, I just, I like these sort of stories. Just like I see DeMar Hamlin go back on the field. Yes. It's a little scary, but I just want to see him back doing the thing that he loves. So anytime something like this happens, um, I, I can't help, but send thoughts and prayers for Bronny and the James family, and I really, really hope that eventually in the in the future that we see uh, LeBron James Jr., Bronny James, uh, in playing basketball. I, I really do. I want to see him play college. I want to see him play the pros. I really hope that this is just a speed bump in the road and not something that's going to deter his career. So that's just what I wanted to say in that, and that's what I wanted to say for all our topics here for quick hits because coming up now we are diving right into our Boston sports because what a week it has been. We've got a big jam packed. Let's get local coming up next. This is our city. As I said, it was a jam-packed week in Boston sports, so let's just get right into it with Let's Get Local. And we're going to start at least in a, on a good side of things, or maybe a sad side of things if you're a Bruins fan. I mean, I, I say it was a whirlwind week, but it was really a whirlwind Tuesday when everything happened. I mean, not only do you have a Supermax extension for Jalen Brown, you got the Pat Patriots in practice, Red Sox playing, 
but Patrice Bergeron announces his retirement for the Boston Bruins after 19 seasons in the black and gold. He's hanging it up. I mean, really just reflecting on the guy's career. He is an all-time great. I mean, six Selkie trophies, three all-star games, obviously won the cup in 2011 and has been the captain for years. He's been an assistant captain for years. Um, honestly, it's just been an incredible career and I'm so glad that I was able to watch him growing up. And this is, you know, it's kind of funny, um, with Adam Jones on WEI for Jones and mega with Arcan. he is, he's kind of not putting down Bergeron's career, but he's not, I guess, respecting it a- as much as I should. And he, he kind of, he kind of thinks that it's, it's an overrated career and the fact that he only won one Stanley cup and that there were a bunch of playoff struggles and stuff like that. I kind of disagree with that. I don't really think it's all, you know, when, when looking at a great athlete, it's not all about winning the big one or winning the championship. I think he is respected, you know, unlike what Jones wants to say, he's one of the best defensive centers. I mean, it's very hard to find a player uh, who's, who's a great two-way player. If you got a, a defenseman who can score or a center or, or a wing who's so good on defense. I mean, it's not solely based on the amount of failures. I mean, should they have more than one Stanley Cup? Absolutely they should, but that's not going to encapsulate the guy's career. I mean, yes, he went to 13, but he went to one in 2013. They lost in 2019. Obviously, this past year when they had the best regular season of all time, and then they drop in the first round. I mean, let's be honest. That's not all on Bergeron, okay? That should be on the whole team. I, I said it in our first return episode was that Jim Montgomery did too much shuffling with the lineup. I don't put that on Patrice Bergeron. Um, So the fact is that this guy had a tremendous career. I expect to see number 37 in the, in the rafters sooner rather than later. In fact, I'll be very upset if it doesn't happen next year. (laughs) I really don't. I know, you know, you might have to wait until uh, the hall of fame um, for any, for any kind of move like that. But I want to see 37 in the, I want to see it in the rafters next season. Um, and, you know, really just looking back um, at that Florida series, the way it ended, I, I it does make sense now. You saw uh, following that game seven loss in OT, Bergeron, he was hugging his teammates and he was in tears, especially when he was hugging Marshan. Um, so it, it kind of makes sense. And he did say in his press conference that, you know, he kind of was leaning towards it um, after last year. Because remember, this was the exact same talk. Is he going to come back? He signs a one-year deal. Um, but really, he you know, he said it himself, is that when he signed, he, th- he kind of knew in the back of his mind that 2022-2023 was going to be his last season. And the fact that he gets to go on top, win a Selkie Award, get to 1,000 points, I mean, what a tremendous career. What a tremendous career. Um, and I know we're definitely going to be, at least Boston is going to be honoring him for a long, long time. Now, in terms of on the ice, how do they replace it? I mean, it kind of made sense with the moves that they've made, you know, picking up guys like Van Riemsdyk, bringing back Lucic. It, it makes sense trying to fill him in at the top line center spot. But really, the way I see the line chart is you're probably going to get Charlie Coyle moving up to that first line. He'll probably be... Uh, on that top line. Then you have Pavel Zaka, Trent Frederick right behind him. So I think the center depth is going to be really good. The problem I have is with the scoring because, I mean, we know what they lost. They lost Dmitry Orlov. They lost Garnett Hathaway. They lost Tyler Bertuzzi. So they lost a lot of their talent from a year ago, which means a lot of their young guns are going to have to step up. You know, more on the plate for uh, David Posternock, more on the plate for Jake DeBrusque, uh, just to name a few guys. And, you know, I'm I'm not worried about the leadership standpoint with Brad Marchand probably going to be uh, named the captain. Um, he's probably, I won't say he'll be as good a captain as Bergeron or even Zidane Ochara, but at least a guy who's been around for a little bit of time. You know, that's, I think that's another reason why they brought on Milan Lucic is to kind of help uh, Marchand in that leadership role. Because let's be honest, if Bergeron ain't coming back, David Krejci ain't coming back, even though he hasn't really announced it yet. Um, I don't expect him back in the ice for the Bruins. Um, so that that's how I, I see this situation with Bergeron. We honor the guy's career and uh, 
are on the ice. Um, I think they'll they'll have it'll be easy to replace them um, in terms of the center spot. But I can't say they're going to be, you know, President's Trophy again. They're, they're not going to be the best team in hockey like they were last year. But, you know, I think they can be sort of a fringe playoff team. You know, maybe get one of those wild card spots, you know, kind of come back down to earth with uh, what I saw. So, uh, Bergeron, thanks for the tremendous memories that you made as a member of the Bruins. But let's talk about the Red Sox because we mentioned it at the top of the show. The trade deadline's the big one. And really... Um, I wanted to mention the Red Sox as maybe the top team to watch because they are in one of the 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 rare situations where they can't it would be it would make sense to be a buyer, but it would also make sense for them to stand pat and do nothing. And really, if you ask me, I don't think the series in San Francisco uh, really deterred anything because let's face it, they should have won those games. Both games were lost on a walk off, you know, just some crazy situations with. J.D. Davis hitting a home run on Kenley Jansen's first pitch. Um, They come back later on in the 8th, and then they lose it in the 11th. Um, But this is a tricky situation because they can play well against good teams like San Fran, but then you come back and you lose two out of three to Oakland. You uh, lose series to, uh, you know, Kansas City, Detroit, stuff like that. They just can't beat the bad teams. And honestly, if they don't do that, then they don't make the playoffs. And if you're asking me, can the roster that they have now turn things around and beat those bad teams? Maybe they could, especially with Trevor Story coming back. They're going to look really good in a week or so. Uh, Trevor Story, you know, doing his rehab assignments. He's now in Worcester. He'll come back in the next week or so, uh, if I had to guess. Chris Sale is also coming back. But again, like I said last week, you still have to rely on on getting starting pitching because Chris Sale is too fragile, okay? You can't bank on Sale making all of his starts every five days uh, all the way up until the postseason. If you can make it, you cannot bank on that. That's why if you do get a starting pitcher, you have the flexibility with Tanner Houck and Garrett Whitlock when they come back. You know Brian Bayo and James Paxson are at the top of that uh, rotation. And you have uh, Cutter Crawford as a nice, decent backup. You also have Nick Pavetta, who can come out of the bulk and has been incredible in the bullpen rule. So I still want them to get uh, some starting pitching. Now, does that mean they have to uh, sell James Paxton or Adam Duvall? Honestly, um, I... I I started with saying, yes, you might need to trade James Paxson, but now I, I just want to see them hold on to him. Because let's face it, since he's uh, started for the Sox this year, he's 6-2 and two with a 3-3-4 ERA. Uh, and really, he's only had two bad starts. He's only been given up like two or three. Like I said, 3-3-4 ERA, that's pretty good. Okay, I, I, He's not ranking among qualified starters because he hasn't made enough starts yet. But he's been one of the best starters that the American League has seen. And I don't think that the Sox go anywhere uh, if Paxton isn't there. And, you know, he might be playing for a bigger contract. If you really ultimately think that you can't re-sign him at the end of the year, then you should make a move. But I do think they can find a way to hold on to James Paxton because, let's face it, 35, he's old, he's got injury history. I don't know how many teams are really going to take the chance the chance on that, and we know Heim Bloom loves to go cheap. So if you think of it like that, James Paxson can be a name that you bring back um, at the end of the year. So that's why I would hold on to James Paxton. The same thing with Adam Duvall. I initially was okay with seeing him get traded, but he has played really well recently. I mean, he's had some great fielding um, in the last couple of games, and he's got two home runs in his last five games. I think having that sort of lineup flexibility is going to be big for the Red Sox because let's face it, we know Jaron Duran has been great, but we have to make sure, you know, if if we do want to think young, we do want to give him as much time as possible. But the fact is, if you're not 100% certain that Duran can keep this stuff up, then you should keep Duvall and sort of have him as that sort of anchor role and just play the matchups because we know Cora loves to play the matchups, putting uh, Rob Refsnyder against lefties or putting Adam Duvall against lefties and then Jaron Duran against righties. That's essentially what you're you're looking at right now. So 
I mean, it, it was a tough series, obviously, you know, losing two out of three to the Giants, but I don't think that deters me at all. I still think that they should be buyers, and I will be disappointed if they don't make any kind of adjustment or movement because you can't bank, like I said last week, you can't bank on these injured guys coming back that they're definitely going to turn things around, that Chris Sale, Tanner Houck, and Garrett Whitlock are going to turn the rotation around, and Trevor Story is going to make the lineup that much more dangerous. I don't think you can bank on it. Plus, you know, you have Justin Turner, at and he's which, by the way, what an incredible stretch. I mean, I knew he was going to be a great locker room guy, but I did not think he was going to put up the numbers that he has been putting up. Um, he's one of the best hitters in the league in the month of July. Just the whole Red Sox have done tremendous in the month of July, and hopefully they can replicate that in August. But I don't think they can replicate it unless they get an insurance starting pitcher. That's how I see it with the Red Sox. And hopefully they make a move by the time this episode comes out and they get themselves a starter within their rotation. Uh, but obviously, we talked about football. The Patriots have been a team really to watch for at least in my mind, because it, it's been a really interesting strategy to begin training camp because for the offense, it's been nothing but red zone work. I mean, today was the first day that they were in pads and it was then that they started doing stuff outside of the red zone. And I, I heard the word that this was an often word that we used a lot last week on EEI. Uh, it was that Phil Perry used clunky as a word for the offense. And I, I can see that. Because he also said, you know, the coordination was fine, but it was just the execution on that offense was a little clunky. You had Mac Jones making bad decisions, um, making some interceptions and some near interceptions. Um, I wasn't concerned with the coordination of things. I was more concerned with how does it look on the field. And I know, you know, not to overreact. You know, I'm not trying to overreact when I hear clunky. I'm thinking, oh, no, the sky is falling for the Patriots and it's back to the way it was. No, I don't think that. I'm just saying early on with what we have to work with is that the offense still continues to struggle, but maybe with pads coming around, I mean, I have yet to look at the updates from guys like uh, Tommy Curran or Mike Cadillac, Andy Hart, those guys. I've yet to see uh, anything like that. Um, I think actually Cadillac did say in a tweet that this offense is going to be much different uh, than it normally looks uh, from a year ago obviously, because they have a functioning coordinator in Bill O'Brien. Um, but if you're asking me about what I've seen so far, am I a little bit concerned? Yeah, a little bit. Um, I mean, they don't have tremendous talent. You know, not like I mentioned with the Jets. You know, you I, I can't bank on, you know, Juju Smith-Schuster being an ultimate number one or this two tight end format with Hunter Henry and Mike Kosicki working. Um, just hopefully Mac Jones is able to uh, look at some stuff and, you know, hopefully the positive energy, because he said that um, things are good and he likes working with Bill O'Brien and he thinks that uh, things are good with Belichick. You know, hopefully that actually translates to on the field stuff, because we've heard all this talk about how, oh, the Patriots culture is back and Bill Belichick and stuff. Uh, Bill Belichick is losing the locker room, stuff like that. I want to see how it goes once we get into some game action. So once the preseason gets underway, then I'll have a firm grasp on, okay, this is something to really monitor, really monitor for. So it's just only a few days. Um, it's been a week for Patriots training camp. So, you know, don't, don't put any, you know, of what I'm saying, you know, don't write it on paper. I'm just, I'm slightly concerned, but I'm not going to be completely concerned. Um, but lastly, to end the whirlwind week that was for Boston, obviously Jalen Brown getting his Supermax. The numbers are at $304 million. The final year, he's going to be making nearly $70 million. He's got a trade kicker and no player option. And, you know, I, I already talked about this because I did expect that the Celtics would get it done because really they had no choice but to offer this extension to Jalen Brown. You got a guy who's making all NBA. I really had no expectations that he was going to get traded. Absolutely not. I think the best situation was for him to stick around with the Celtics. And now, hopefully, because now it's on him, because he he played up to that contract. He got his contract. Now he's got to go execute it. He's got to practice dribbling with his left hand. He's got to get better at making decisions. He can't be running into traffic against three other guys, even though he's one of uh, the best finishers out there. 
So I really hope that Brown, after this contract, really works on his game and understands that you don't just, once you sign this contract, you don't get to ease up. You have to prove yourself into this contract. And because there is uh, a trade kicker on this, that means he's sticking around for a little bit of time. Okay, so let's just hope that Jalen Brown understands the memo after getting this contract that it's time to get things going. Okay, so that is where we are with Boston sports. And coming up next to end the show, because it's been so crazy in Boston sports, we got to lighten things up and get to our LOL moment of the week. Coming up next. So to end our show, as we always do, we look at our LOL moment of the week. And we are actually going to the UFC for this one. I know producer Ryan Garvin from WEI who will, will like this one very much. But we are going to the UFC because obviously it was the big event uh, on Saturday. UFC 290-something, you know, 300. I, I have no idea what it is. But anyway, we're going to uh, one of these fights. And uh, Derek Lewis is uh, one, of, one of the top fighters out there. And he won in 33 seconds, which is very impressive. Very few times can you win a UFC fight in less than a minute or roughly around that time. But Lewis decides to win, or he doesn't decide to win, obviously. He goes out and he wins in 33 seconds. And then what does he do to celebrate? Now, most guys, when you celebrate, um, you know, the guys will stomp around kind of like a wrestler, just go out, strut their stuff, maybe like flex their muscles, you know, something like that. But Lewis decided to go to a different route. He decides to take off his shorts and go down to his underwear and celebrates in the octagon in front of a live audience, not just in the arena, but at home watching. He's in his underwear celebrating a victory. Now, I don't know how you listeners or watchers feel about this, but I would not want to be anywhere in public in my underwear. Not at all. Not at all. And I know they're saying picture everyone in your underwear. Yeah, that's how I want to picture it. I don't want to see anyone in their underwear in public, really. Okay, so the fact that Lewis decides to go ahead, I mean, it is in Vegas, you know, at at least I think it's in Vegas uh, where this event was. And we do know everything can happen in Vegas when you're in there, you know, the old saying, what happens there stays there. But the fact that the celebration decides, he decides to go ahead, just stand in the middle, pull down his shorts and just struts around in his underwear. Then he does sort of like, a, I guess, uh, what's that group in wrestling, like DX or something like that, like sort of the suck it symbol. And then he goes up to like the top of the cage. He's straddling it. He's throwing around his shorts. I mean, I I wish I could know the answer for Derek Lewis, why he decided to do that. Because honestly, I'm not comfortable. Sometimes I don't even feel comfortable wearing underwear in my own house, much less in public. I mean, thousands and thousands of people saw that. And unfortunately, the internet lives forever. So he's going to have to stick with whatever comes out of it. So Derek Lewis... I have no idea what you're thinking with that celebration. I don't know if it was pre-planned or if you just thought about it in the moment, just being like, here's what I'm going to do to celebrate because I hadn't won a match in 33 seconds before. I'm just going to pull my pants down, pull my shorts down, let the world see my underwear, and we'll just go nuts. I mean, I don't know what you're thinking, Derek Lewis, but because you did that, you landed yourself into this week's LOL moment of the week for giving us a UFC celebration that... I don't think anyone has ever seen before. And with that, we are done here with episode 84 of Let Me Speak. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you're listening to us wherever you get your podcasts or you're watching us on YouTube, make sure you are following our social media pages. Look on Facebook and Instagram. You just have to search Let Me Speak podcast. That's a wrap, and we will see you next time. Later!